So, photographing Italy, identity, history, and the contemporary landscape. I am going to uh, show you a slide. Um, I had already quite a few requests about uh, wanting to know more about the program and what it entails, when are the next appointments. So, as it is in our tradition, we've tried to um, scatter the talks over the next few months, one a month, roughly. And uh, so today we're starting with a history of photography that encompasses the invention of photography. I'm going to try to map an interesting series of connections between the history of painting and photography and explore the birth of photography as it takes place um, across 1826 and 1839, the two key dates uh, of the invention of photography, but also more especially in Italy, to understand how Italy plays a very special role in the invention of photography and its early days. We're going to move on next month from the foundation of the subject, the invention of photography and the early steps of photography in Italy, to the conception of truth and fiction. We're going to explore a number of photographers and incredible works of art uh, that contributed to the emergence of uh, Italy's cultural national identity. And there, there'll be a few surprises there too. Very exciting, it's a very exciting subject. And uh, in April we will look at the early modern photography in Italy, the emergence of the futurists, um, their experimentations with photography and movement and dynamism, and also the importance, the important role played by photography in the context of uh, political propaganda and ideologies. We're going to look at the intersections between fascism and photography. And then the uh, May appointment focuses on contemporary uh, photography in Italy, which is particularly interesting to me because that's where I think the identity quest the question of what is the contemporary Italian identity uh, beyond the stereotypes, beyond the cliches that have defined the representation of Italy abroad, mostly, uh, is about. What, what is this Italy that is contemporary and relevant to Italians that is being explored through representation of the landscape? As I mentioned in the um, abstract for this series, Italy and the landscape through photography are a complex, complex paradigm in which construction of landscapes and representations of landscapes from the Italian perspective can help devise new identities, new realistic conceptions of what it means to be Italian today. So, the landscape, the natural, the, the natural landscape, the representation of nature in, uh, in photography plays an, a very important role uh, in the way in which contemporary Italian photographers are addressing this subject. So these are the key dates, put them in your calendar, make sure you don't miss out. We also have two more appointments that will happen later on, perhaps in June, uh, in which I will hold um, conversations with contemporary Italian photographers. So that, that will be a very interesting addition to what we normally do in our series for the um, Institute of Culture. And let's begin, since we have a lot of material to cover. And we're starting with a relatively big question. What is a photograph? Hmm. Well, next time we meet in a month, we're going to address the question, what does a photograph do, right? Photography is an incredible invention. And it's easy for us to give it for granted because we're surrounded by photographs. How many photographs have you taken today, even without having to leave the house? Now that cameras are in our phones, it's so easy to just capture the world around us. But it wasn't always the case. And I think it's important, especially for tonight's talk, to think about a world without photography and a world that therefore has structured itself very differently from the modern world we know and the contemporary world we live in. Photography was one of those colossal inventions that we could only really come to understand fully 
in time and that we probably haven't quite fully grasped even today because technology keeps shifting photography's the agency of photography along and it complicates photography every time that's part of what we will explore together but as i said earlier photography is an invention that's bigger than us you know a few times in the history of humankind we have invented something that we couldn't really understand you can argue that the internet is the other big invention that we created and it's like okay what is this for because we're still working out what it is good for and what's bad about the internet well the same applies uh, to photography and photography and the internet, I argue, are world-changing inventions. They don't just change what we do, they change the way in which we think about ourselves and the way in which we think about the world. But we can also think about photography as the continuation of a dream. The continuation of a dream that in 1826 becomes reality. So what is this dream? And I'll show you later uh, how important is 1826 as a date for our journey through the invention of photography. But before we get there to understand what this dream is about, we need to return all the way down to the Middle Ages. So we're back to the 5th century and we're thinking about painting because painting was always essentially part of an important dream. What has painting done for us over time? It has done plenty of things. It has helped us to still time. It has helped us to preserve beauty. It has helped us to represent what fades and what is difficult to pin down and grasp. Think about a world in which images are very rare. That was the Middle Ages. Images were mostly available in churches and they looked like fantastical apparitions, like holographic apparitions. They were magical, truly magical, but especially during the, Med the Middle Ages, as you can see, realism is not the essential element of painting. This work by Masaccio, which happens to be made at the very beginning of the Renaissance, is already showing a little more realism than the previous works I showed you. When you compare it right next to the Madonna by Cimabue, with the same uh, subject, the Madonna and Throne, you can see how drastically the representation has changed only in a few hundred years. And what I wanted to do is to trace this history of this dream of preserving beauty still in time until it takes us up to the invention of photography. The Middle Ages is a place of narrative. Painting is a tool through which stories can be told and understood by those who cannot read. Proportions and perspective are arbitrary. Realism is not the essential tool through which to represent the world because clarity governs the real essence of painting. The image has to be clearly readable from a narrative standpoint. That's what really matters. And we see that over and over and over in this beautiful medieval works that lead up to the beginning of the Renaissance. Giotto is considered already to be a threshold between the tradition of flat and synthetic representation of the Middle Ages and what will come next with the Renaissance. But between um, the flatness and the spirituality, the divine representation of the Middle Ages and the realism of the Renaissance, there's the Black Death. The Black Death was the changing agent of the world, and it was a pandemic. I think, you know, we can all rejoice in the knowledge that um, COVID-19 wasn't quite the Black Death, because considering how we handled it, we'd probably all be dead. Now that I've cheered you up, um, the Black Death changed Europe and really brought the Middle Ages to an end. How? By killing 25 million people in Europe alone over a few period of time, only roughly five years. Those who survived the uh, Black Death found themselves surrounded by relative wealth, by a completely different economic setup that 
enabled the emergence of the um, new upper classes, the new aristocratic classes of the Renaissance. And the emergence of art, the development of art through the Renaissance is linked to this economic well-being and to humanism. Think about making it through something as tragic as the Black Death and surviving it. From an existentialist perspective, many questions needed to be answered. Why did it happen? What did we do, God, to deserve this? And what do we do now with the knowledge we have acquired through that experience? So humanism is the return, the rediscovery, the principle of a philosophical root that in Italy belongs to Greece. It's the connection between classical Greece and what the Italian Renaissance will become. The Renaissance, the rebirth of classical knowledge. Through humanism, we find the reprise of realism. This is the dream. Realism is extremely important in Western art, but I always care to say that it's not a Western art invention. One of my favorite works of art of all times is this beautiful Chinese scroll by Huang Quan, who, well before we get to the Italian Renaissance, we're looking at uh, 400 years roughly before the Italian Renaissance, painted these beautiful birds and insects and turtles in the uttermost delicate realism. Look, he even placed these birds in perspective, as you can see here, because the purpose of this work was to teach his son how to paint animals in, and how to study them and to see them from different angles. So that's to say that when other cultures have a purpose to employ realism, they can do it too. Like, for instance, in this case, with this beautiful uh, bronze head of Eif that predates the Italian Renaissance by roughly 200 years, which, again, displays this extremely beautiful um, kind of realism. And these heads were made in contemporary Nigeria and cast in bronze in a way that were um, absolutely complex and refined. So, realism during the Renaissance as you know, this is what's happening uh, at the same time as we see the, the heads of Eif and um, the, the work by Huang Quan, is the accomplishment in the West of the revival of Greek classical art, which, so that we're all on the same page, looks like this. Our beautiful marbles, classical sculptures in which um, beauty and nakedness symbolize the dignity and moral value of the human mind. How else would you display the ethical values and the moral values of the human by mind if not through the healthy and um, well-proportioned body? So this connection between classical Greece and the Renaissance establishes realism as the only language that can be spoken through painting throughout the history of Western art. And perspective, central perspective, which was um, theorized by Alberti, becomes the best friend of realism, as you can see here. You could not paint in any other way at the time, but in a realistic style. And this realism is designed to center the human, is designed to place us in a privileged position and in a position of intimacy with the representation. While medieval representations aimed to separate the divine from the materiality of the living, Renaissance painting is a window onto the world. And you can see here how Leonardo really exploits this idea with this beautiful aerial perspective we see at the back of um, Santana and the Madonna. But Leonardo knew a thing or two, a secret that is at the root of the history of photography. He knew about optical devices that could be used in order to shortcut around painting. Well, this is one of the representations we find in the Codice Atlantico, you know, like Leonardo's notebooks. 
And it is not clear if Leonardo himself used these optical devices in order to bypass challenges involving copying nature in order to summon the uttermost realism in his work, or whether he just speculated around these devices. But we know something for sure, that Italian artists and some Northern European artists used this tool in order to make their work, their paintings, the Camera Obscura. The Camera Obscura is the grandmother of the photographic camera. And it has a very long history that unfortunately fizzles out into the origin of things as it is with the most exciting of inventions. Uh, it is claimed that a Chinese philosopher, Mo Ti, uh, mentions the camera obscura at around 2,500 um, 2, years ago, and that he talks about it as a tool that it's capable of collecting places. How does the camera obscura work? First of all, it is a contained space, as you can see here in this image. This is another reference point in the history of the invention of the camera obscura. Halazen bin al Haytham uh, was a mathematician who had already played in enclosed spaces through which, through a hole, light could filter through and cast a projection into the space. This is the principle of the camera obscura. You can see this diagram here. This is the box, camera, obscura, dark room. And an object placed right outside it. This is the hole, the pinhole through which light is allowed to travel through, casts a projection of the object outside the box inside it. It is upside down because that's how the uh, light travels through the hole. But nonetheless, it is neat, it is clear, and it is effective. So it doesn't take long for Renaissance artists to harness this incredible invention, and as you can see here, to um, use it, to copy their, the outside, the uh, subject, and trace it onto a canvas or a piece of paper. There were different models of camera obscura that you could use and uh, build for yourself. Some quite complex with different lenses and mirrors that could project the image onto your canvas or sheet of paper exactly at the size you needed it. Now the camera obscura becomes a bit of a bone of contention and actually as I say a bit of a bone of contention I feel like I'm, I'm delivering an understatement here. People argue about this really like argue because um, there's an implication that artists who uh, didn't use the that use the camera obscura cheated and that their ability to structure space as we see here in this beautiful painting by Van Eyck which was most likely made with a camera obscura is a little bit less you know the talent is a little bit less however you have to remember that the camera obscura does not paint the image for you. It certainly facilitates the representation of space, details and perspective. But you still have to apply the color afterwards. And you can see here an incredible level of mastery in these works. The ambassadors by Holbein may have also been created with the use of the camera obscura because of the intricacy that we see here in the uh, marble floor and the amount of detail. This is realism at its best. This is the dream of Western uh, art at this very point, to accentuate realism as much as possible, to create a vivid illusion of life. Then we get to Caravaggio. Now, Caravaggio has been at the center of a lot of controversy when it comes to the use of the camera obscura. Um, the, some restorators have x-rayed many works by Caravaggio and we know for sure that Caravaggio didn't draw. So there are no preparatory sketches or drawings with graphite or charcoal underneath the layers of paint, which is pretty much outstanding when you think about the beauty of these works. So that's where the speculation begins. How could he? Was he just going straight onto the canvas with paint? Or was he using other uh, devices in order to trace 
the image onto the canvas. And there's an interesting scholar, Italian scholar, called Roberta Lapucci, who's a uh, Caravaggio specialist, who's written a lot about Caravaggio, that claims that Caravaggio used the camera obscura and that he actually used crushed fireflies powder in order to um, outline the uh, figures and objects on the canvas and then applied uh, oil color on top. These theories are very much disputed and they cause a lot of controversy. Some of you may have come across a book by David Hockney, uh, the artist David Hockney, who was particularly fascinated by the idea that many Western artists use the camera obscura to make their work and, you know, set off to theorize who may have used it and how. If you're interested, the book is called Secret Knowledge and it's really fascinating. There's also a documentary I think you can still find on YouTube with David Hockney argumenting his thesis. Uh, Vermeer is another artist who comes under fire accused of using the camera obscura, although um, many, uh, many art historians disagree. Uh, most times, the use of the camera obscura is disproved on the ground of finding a hole at the center of the painting. If you find a tiny hole at the center of a painting like this, which happens a lot in Vermeer, it means that the artist has actually placed a pin in the middle and then used a thread attached to the pin to draw the um, converging lines for the perspective, uh, the depth uh, of, the, of the work. So in that case, what you find is a contradiction. If you are tracing the perspective using the camera obscura, then why should you also have the whole of a pin and, uh, you know, which emphasizes the use of a thread to trace uh, converging lines. I can see the um, the argument there, but I can also see how this amount of detail and certain distortions that have been uh, linked to the distortions that are usually caused by a lens can make others assume that actually uh, Vermeer also used the camera obscura. So think about this. The camera obscura has been around hopping around Europe a lot, right? Uh, different artists use it, they all keep it secret because they don't want to get a bad reputation. But the camera obscura is also within the knowledge of physicists and engineers who like to play with optics. You know, those who researched optics as well were interested in the camera obscura and its applications. So the German Johann Henrik Schultz uh, experiments in the early 18th century with different materials and is close, in a sense, to laying the foundations of photography. However, that doesn't quite happen. He works with silver nitrate, and silver nitrate is already, if you like, a foundational ingredient in what will become later on the modern photographic image. However, the big problem with the birth of photography is fixing images. So there are other um, inventors that we will see tonight who get close to inventing photography, but don't invent it because they cannot fix, preserve the image on the support they use to capture the image. Back to the camera obscura, meanwhile, and Italy. Our contribution to the history of photography is substantial, even if we have to admit it, the uh, invention of photography is mostly a French-British deal in the end. This is the camera obscura that was used by Canaletto. You will remember Canaletto and the beautiful vistas of Venice he created. These are incredible images he made using the camera obscura. There is a lot of controversy here too. Uh, which of the paintings have been made with the camera obscura and which have not? Um, why did Canaletto use a camera obscura? Well, you saw my slide claiming this is commercial art, and it is. Canaletto had a very sophisticated um, group of connoisseurs and uh, estimators who loved these paintings, and these happened to be British, French, German collectors who most often undertook the Grand Tour. The Grand Tour was the fir formative journey that all the wealthy and noblemen especially um, from Northern Europe would take at some point in their lives to 
get face to face with the classical culture that formed their education in other countries. So it was their opportunity to move theory from the pages of books to reality and visit Venice, Florence, Rome, Naples, sometimes travel all the way down to Sicily and eventually to Greece. It would take up to five years at times and it was inc an incredible, for incredibly formative opportunity. However, you can imagine that at a time in which photography wasn't invented and in which there were no souvenirs, which I know you would love to bring back souvenirs from Venice, they're so classy. Um, this is what Canaletto did. He provided his clientele with souvenirs. Beautiful, large canvases of Venice that could be shipped back home and wait for you to enjoy them upon your return. The Camera Obscura allowed Canaletto to copy the minutia of Venetian architecture quickly, effectively, and faithfully in a way that by hand could have become more complicated and too time consuming. This is the commercial implication. The more he could get these paintings done faster, the more money he would make, the more famous he would become. He became so famous he ended up moving to Britain, where he was very much loved. Look at these beautiful vistas. And once again, the camera obscura doesn't apply paint to your canvas. That's entirely down to you. But it can certainly help you with the representation of architecture, simplifying the process and streamlining the process so that you can paint faster, produce more works of art to sell. And at the same time, many historians have become interested in these works because they are faithful representations of what um, Venice looked like. We know that on and off he moved around a couple of buildings just to fit them in, but each building seems to be pretty faithful to what it was like at the time. So they are really interesting for historical documentation too. Now that we've been all become um, homesick for Venice, Thomas Wedgwood. Thomas Wedgwood is the other protagonist of the invention of photography. This is a, he's a minor um, protagonist because unfortunately his photograms never fixed. And this is the tragedy of everyone who experimented with photographic uh, techniques, early photographic techniques. I'm going to tell you more about how a photograph comes to life, but Wedgwood worked with what's pretty much this. This is a photogram, not a photograph. There's a difference between the two. A photogram is done without a camera. A photogram is done by laying an object onto the surface of the photographic plate, exposing the object to light, and then processing the photographic plate. The surface that's been exposed to light appears dark. The surface that was blocked by the presence of the object remains light, most often white, and therefore creates a silhouette. Uh, this is one by Henry Fox Talbot, who was one of the key inventors of photography. Unfortunately, Wedgwood never worked out how to fix his uh, photograms. So whenever he took them out into sunlight, they would just fade away and become black, which was a tragedy in so many ways. That's how we get to our 1826, very important date in the history of photography. When you flick through magazines, just general interest magazines, you will find that everyone says, oh, photography was invented in 1839, and it kind of grates on me, because that's not true. Photography was invented in 1826. I'll tell you what happens in 1839 and why general interest magazines and newspapers just cut to the chase and say it was invented in 1839. The first photograph ever taken, and let's say the first photograph that didn't fade away, looked like this. And I know if you were holding your breath, you're not particularly impressed because it is very fuzzy, it is very difficult to see. But it's the work of Joseph Nietz for Nieps, and it's basically what he saw from outside his window. Now, there's one thing in photography that's really important, and it's called exposure. Exposure is the amount of light you allow to come into the camera to impress your plate. At this time in the history of photography, film doesn't exist. So what you're thinking about is a box, which I'm going to show you uh, in a couple of slides. There's 
an image that might help us understand better what we're looking at, which is a gelatin silver print of this original plate made by Nieps. And it looks like this. This is not what Nieps created but it's a rendition of the image that at least allows us to see some of the roofs, right, and understand what he rejoiced for when he realized that he actually captured reality like it ne had never been done before. This is the continuation of the dream that I was mentioning earlier, the idea of getting rid of the artist, that's the dream, and accomplish realism in an objective way. This is the camera he used. And you can see that it's what many of you have discovered already in your lives as a pinhole camera. What's more sophisticated here is the aperture that you see here, made of blades that can be closed to allow more or less light into the box. The plate would be placed into the box from the back. And once you had one photograph, you had one photograph. You couldn't replicate it. There is no negative in the history of photography at this point. Curiosity. What did bring Nieps to um, invent, well, to, to take the first photograph? Italy. Ha ha. You didn't expect that. He used to spend quite a bit of time in Sardinia and loved the landscape and tried and tried to draw it to his satisfaction and never succeeded. You find that the inventors of photography are all artists or wannabe artists who couldn't quite succeed in accomplishing what they wanted and dreamt of a mechanical tool that could help them capturing the beauty they saw. So you can really see this intimate connection between painting, drawing and photography. 1839, the very important date. Well, Nieps is one of the first inventors of photography who dies uh, because of the fumes and toxicity of the materials that were being used uh, to make the first photographs. Uh, the first photograph by Nieps was made on a pewter plate that was covered in bitumen of Judea. Uh, there is a level of toxicity in many of these um, elements that affected him and also affected Louis Daguerre, who was the inventor of an other iteration of photography called the daguerreotype. Now, this is Louis Daguerre himself represented in a daguerreotype. This is a mission for you. When you get a chance to explore the world in person once again, put it on your bucket list. You have to see a daguerreotype in person because I cannot do it justice with this slide or even with this other slide of a cat. The daguerreotype is an incredible accomplishment. First of all, it's relatively small, tends to be pocket size, and as you can see, it comes framed beautifully in these pockets, um, sort of uh, cases. They're cases made of different materials, sometimes uh, made of wood, sometimes made of metal, and they were meant to be portable. They were sort of keepsakes, often used for the representation and portraits of loved ones. They are copper plates, metal plates of different kinds, polished to a mirror finish that have been treated with different uh, com a complexity, really complex layering of different chemicals involving vapors of mercury. And what happens with the daguerreotype is that it looks like a mirror. And when you, when you just tilt it in your hands, it's like a portal that you can access. So it looks like a hologram. It's not a photograph in the contemporary conception of what, it, of what we see today when we look at a photograph. Find a way to get your hands on the daguerreotype and take a look at it. Last time I checked, we had some on the lower um, floor, uh, lower ground floor at the Art Institute um, in the photography galleries. So you just see them there, absolutely stunning creation. So here it is, the first hipster ever photographed on a daguerreotype. Um, no surprise, everyone so, was so excited about the daguerreotype. Daguerre perfected the camera that Nieps had created, applying a lens, as you can see there, and he captured incredible details. 
Paris was ablaze with enthusiasm in 1839 when photography was gifted to the world. You know, the French were so kind and illuminated. Progress and technology were gifts to share. And they did share it with everyone but Britain. This is the twist in the history of photography that will lead to the invention of photography the way we know it, the modern kind of photography. But what happens in Italy, you're wondering? Well, good news. Despite the fact that photography is invented technically in France and it's launched in France, because of the connection that was long-standing between Paris and Milan, photography arrives in Milan almost at the same time as it is launched in, um, in Paris. And there is a lot of excitement in Milan about photography. The um, dissemination and popularization of photography in Milan is linked to uh, the Ottico Duroni, who had an optics uh, optician shop in uh, the Galleria de Cristoforis next to the Duomo in Milan and held a demonstration. Here's our Alessandro Duroni. Uh, he held a demonstration on how to produce a daguerreotype. And I just wish and I hope you can imagine the magic surrounding this type of um, incredible event. Finally, the dream of capturing reality is here. You can use this device, a camera, expose reality to it, and reality is transferred onto a metal plate, and it looks exquisitely detailed. Alessandro Duroni will become uh, one of the earliest and most important photographers in Italy, but he, he also had a shop. Um, an optician's shop in Paris. So he imported all the materials needed for processing um, the daguerreotype from Paris directly. I wanted to show you his, uh, one of his few surviving daguerreotypes. And as you can see here is a, a beautiful funerary monument that was photographed. There is something about the daguerreotype and early photography that I have not mentioned to you, but that it's really important. We talked about exposure time. We talked about exposure, and I mentioned to you that that's the amount of time you allow light to filter through the camera. But I didn't tell you that the first photograph taken by Nieps required an exposure time of eight hours. Now, that's a long click, isn't it? It's a very long time for a surface a light sensitive surface to receive information. That's also why the image is so blurry, because the sun shifts, let's say shadows shift across the sky and create blurry effects. For a very long time, photography was a matter of capturing static objects. The daguerreotype cuts the exposure times dramatically. But still, at the very beginning, it's difficult to capture people. If you went to a photographic studio during the 19th century, at the cusp of the invention of photography, like, you know, in 1839 or more, most likely 1840, 1841, you would have been overwhelmed by the contraptions that a photographer had to put in place, a headrest and other uh, devices, a chair, that was specifically designed to keep you looking natural and yet still for sometimes a matter of 15 seconds, 20 seconds. Don't blink your eyes, otherwise you look, will look like you're possessed by the devil. There were so many complications about taking early photographs. So it's no coincidence that this first experiment, one of these earliest experiments by Duroni, is of sculptures, subjects that don't move. But not everyone in Italy was as lucky as Duroni um, to have a connection, a direct a connection with um, Paris. So uh, Enrico Federico Gest, the first photographer in Piedmont, actually recreated his own technology in Turin and took this image of Turin, which is the first photograph ever taken in that area. And as you can see again, it dates 1839. He's one of the most important pioneers 
in the history of Italian photography. But back to Duroni, who I said was one of the most prolific and earliest photographer. This is Piazza del Duomo in Milan. Isn't it astonishing? None of these buildings stand and it becomes complicated to understand which way we are looking. The Duomo is clearly behind us or on the side. And you can see that photography becomes a great opportunity to document architecture, to document everyday life and document reality. Now there's another phenomenon that it's very specific to Italy that it's different from the rest of Europe. And we will explore that as I show you more images. But I have to tell you that Daguerre's fortune with the daguerreotype was limited. The daguerreotype was expensive still, and it was not reproducible. You still placed a metal plate inside your camera, exposed it to light, and it was a one-take deal. You could not reproduce the same image. Let's go to Britain and see what happens. All the Brits are disappointed that the European continent is playing with photography, but they've been left out because the French and the Brits just don't like each other. And that gives somebody a great opportunity to reinvent photography all over again. So Henry Fox Talbot really had a rough night when he knew, when he was told that Daguerre launched photography in Paris. It's like, oh wow, that's what I was working on. He was working on that too? I didn't know. See the things that happen without the internet? It's not as easy as going on Google and just checking that somebody has not invented something that you wanted to invent already. So it really played in Talbot's favor that Britain was cut off from the photographic licensing and Talbot reinvented photography. His type of photography was called calotype, the beautiful impression. Now the beautiful impression had a very important quality. It wasn't quite as refined and detailed as the daguerreotype, but it was cheaper to make, it printed on paper, and it came with a negative. That meant commercial viability. It was the future of photography. Daguerre wasn't too disappointed because he was given a massive pension and a mansion to live in, he never had to work again, that was from, from France. But the daguerreotype by the 1860s is disappearing and it's replaced by the calotype. These are still daguerreotypes from Luigi Sacchi. Luigi Sacchi was another Italian pioneer and you can see Milan again in this beautiful image. What I love about these images is the absence of cars. Isn't it amazing? If you're also asking yourselves, why is there no people? At what time were these images made? It was like these still required a quite extensive exposure at times. And well, there weren't quite as many people around in the streets as there are today, but people were not captured by early photography. So there is this strange eerie um, effect that just happens when you photograph a city. People, if they're walking, they move too fast for the photograph to capture their presence. So beautiful view of, uh, again, the Duomo in Milan, which hasn't changed one bit, but what is around it has changed dramatically. The piazza is not there, and you can see here these, these buildings that uh, occupy the space in which now the Galleria Vittorio Emanuele stands are instead present. I can't even imagine what it would have been like to open your windows and see something as beautiful as Milan's Duomo uh, just outside. And of course, Italy is all about architecture. It's all about history. It's all about ruins. So this is the essence, essential difference between the emergence of photography in France, the emergence of photography in Britain, the subjects that are essential to the birth of photography elsewhere, the portrait. That's what everyone cares about. But when it comes to Italy, the portrait is not the driving force through which uh, photography develops. Giacomo Caneva was another pioneer, early pioneer of Italian photography. And of course, we're shifting down to Rome. What's interesting about the beginning of uh, photography in Italy is that it starts in Milan, moves up to Turin, and then it trickles down to Venice, Florence, Naples, Rome, no, Rome, Naples. And it's really a, a national, if you like, uh, 
uh, moment. You know, there, there is a sense of innovation that actually travels far. And this is where we, we encounter the first stumbling block with identity, the representation of landscape, and Italy. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Giacomo Caneva, as you can see, chooses subjects that are just essentially important to the history of Italy. You have to remember that when you photograph, for as objective as you try to be, one of the most important things the photographer does is to select. What you point at is already a work of art in the sense that it's an interpretation of the world. It's no longer the world as it is. What you leave outside defines what is inside. The way in which you capture what is inside also begins to tell a story that the world cannot quite tell. So Giacomo Caneva became a specialist in the representation of Rome and beautiful Roman monuments and ruins. This is where the national identity of Italy begins to be constructed through the photographic lens. And as you can tell, it's an identity based in the past, grounded in the past, grounded in architectural glories. But that's not necessarily a problem. This is why it's actually viable to argue that despite the fact that photography was invented in uh, Paris and then uh, further developed in Britain, Italy plays a very important role in the history of photography itself because everyone flocked to Italy to photograph it. It was where everyone wanted to be to experiment and to catalogue. There's a frenzy where uh, photographers from Scotland arrive in Italy and want to have an opportunity to pioneer something unique that had never been seen before. So this place, which I hope you can visit when um, traveling becomes an option again, was the mecca of photographers from all over Europe. It's the Café Greco in Rome, which dates back to 1760. It's one of the oldest um, cafes pretty much anywhere in Europe. And it was a, a bit of a, a kind of cultural circle in which many different artists and um, photographers gathered. So Stendhal was there, Goethe was there, Schopenhauer stopped by to have a cappuccino, uh, Byron stopped by, Keats stopped by, lots of philosophers, music um, composers like Mendelssohn and apparently Casanova also had a sip. So Café Greco is this cultural gathering in which early photographs were being discussed, in which, as you can see, of course, a crowd of men would talk about what can be accomplished with photography, this new and exciting medium. And of course, the idea is to preserve, which in a sense plays a bit of a trick in the possibility for Italy to develop its own cultural identity through uh, photography. There was a sense of loss. The idea that the Industrial Revolution and the changing times that pervaded Europe were damaging and tarnishing the heritage, the cultural heritage that, despite it being Italian, felt of European uh, interest. France, Britain and Germany had a specific historical interest in the study of Italian architecture. You have to remember that the neoclassical period that dominates the 18th century, it's all about neoclassical architecture traveling across Europe. So there were waves and waves of interest for Italy. Also uh, motivated by the discovery of Pompeii and Herculanum in the middle of the 18th century. So it is at this point that Italy starts to find itself um, desired and at the same time subjugated by the desire of foreigners to preserve and manage its heritage and beauty. And even if it's not a matter of managing uh, quite yet, it's a matter of interpretation. One of the most interesting is John Ruskin. I'm sure that's a name you've heard many times before. John Ruskin was a colossal, towering figure in the history of British art. And as an art historian, his contribution 
to the history of art in Italy is substantial. He traveled to Venice, he was so excited to capture the beauty of Venice uh, that he actually owned his own uh, camera to take daguerreotypes. And this is one of the images he took in collaboration with John Hobbes. He worked with a network of, of photographers who could help him create one of his most beautiful books that's entirely dedicated to Venice, which was published just around 1853-54, which to me is incredible how quickly he could actually get these things together at the time. Um, this is the beginning of a sense of um, urgency to catalogue Italy before, as John Ruskin put it, hordes of vandals destroy the beauty that remains. There was decay, and of course the problem with Italy is that there's too much to preserve, even today, to preserve it properly. So photographing these beautiful um, architectural remains, archaeological discoveries, became a mission through which to document Italy, its history, but also to which to come to term with the writing of history itself. For the first time in the history of the world, representing these beautiful objects that capture the history of civilization is no longer down to the interpretation of artists. It's a matter of visibility of something that it's considered to be more real, even if it's interpreted to a certain degree. This is one of my favorite photographs from the selection of John Raskin, in which you can actually see this beauty of the architectural uh, building and this very Venetian um, hanging style that you see here. So there is a desire to represent a Venice that belongs to the past and at the same time uh, a, uh, an impossibility to contain a different uh, kind of level of everyday life that photography cannot erase. That's the difference between painting and photography that some found offensive at the time, how photography doesn't embellish, how photography doesn't purge, and instead how it represents seemingly everything in front of our eyes. This is another interesting uh, image by Ruskin in which you can see that the exposure time here must have added up to a decent amount of seconds, probably anything like 15 to 25, in which you can see that the um, Canal Grande's waters are actually uh, very blurry as a result because of the waves and the movement. And there's the ghostly shadow of a uh, ship of some description. It's hard to tell. Certainly something bigger than a gondola that was cutting through. This is what photography, early photography, um, helps to capture. And this is the beginning of the first albums, photographic albums of daguerreotypes as well as calotypes that are put together to create portraits of Italian cities. This is the one that was made, one of the many that was made for Milan. And a connection to painting once again, the ruin. The early aesthetic of photography in Italy is dominated by the painterly tradition of the picturesque. Painterly tradition of the picturesque entails this time and past imbuing everything. It's, it's basically the nightmare, what will become the nightmare, the haunting element of Italian culture, haunted by its past and haunted by a past that it's no longer useful, but that seems to stand as a reminder of a greatness that once was. You can see here the work of Panini and the ways in which the images are composed echo what photographers will do. It's the other way around. It's the photographs that echo what uh, the works of Panini, for instance, uh, set as a uh, compositional rhetoric. And of course, the importance of the work of Giovanni Piranesi, the work of Piranesi were popular across Europe and contributed to the construction of uh, Italian identity. So we find early photographs of archaeological and cultural interest replicating those ideas as much as possible. As you can see 
in these beautiful images. The absence of the human figure is also essential to create the image of a timeless Italy, that it's pretty much contained into a historical dimension that other countries cannot quite grasp. And of course, the natural beauty. Robert MacPherson was a Scottish photographer who, as you can see, focused on the idea that Italy is all about the landscape. So this predominance of the Italian landscape that becomes absolutely um, foregrounding and essential to the identity construction that we will see uh, develops throughout the, the, the few decades that follow in the next century. Something interesting about this first lecture and the last lecture in the series is that we begin with a focus on landscape, that it's just natural, that's what it is, that's what happens in the history of Italian photography, to find ourselves again discussing landscape as it emerges in the images of Luigi Ghiri and other photographers towards the 70s, the 80s, and then becomes a colossal um, subject in the history of contemporary Italian photography. And um, one last photograph for tonight. It's a beautiful representation of a garden by one of the many, uh, one of the very few and rarest Italian female photographer. This is Jane Martha St. John, who wasn't born in Italy but spent substantial time in Italy and photographed this beautiful garden in Rome. Believe it or not, even to photography, gender stereotypes applied. And whereas men were invited to document architecture, archaeology, and history, women were generally pushed towards the representation of plants, flowers, and uh, nature more in general. On that note, I hope you, I managed to give you a, a general grounding of the essential uh, details in the history of Italian photography, how it emerges and how it is the continuation of this dream that painting had laid bare, this desire to stop time, this desire to capture reality in the most accurate of ways, which then also equates to disposing of the artist and trying to capture the objectivity of photography, which as we will see moving on in the next lectures, is not objective in the slightest.